Turn to Romans 6. Romans 6, Romans 8. We'll start there. And uh, then I'm going to open up my heart to you this morning. I mentioned in Sunday school, uh, somebody I know reached out to me because something happened to them a couple years ago. It was a pretty, pretty bad situation. And he said it afflicted his mind. He said, I'm not the same. I'm just not the same person. He used to be real strong character, real strong personality, not really afraid of much. And um, he just went through this real bad satanic attack. And he said it, it just changed him. And now he deals with bouts of depression, anxiety. And apparently he's going through that now and he's been reaching out to me and I've been sharing things with him and so on. And, and um, I had mentioned this before and I'm mentioning again this morning um, when we found out Lisa had cancer that just brought, it wasn't that I wasn't like this before, but it just really brought a lot of things back to me and, and it affected me. And it, I know it had to have affected her more than me, um, but it, it hit me pretty hard. And uh, still from time to time, uh, I wake up some days and I'm just not, there's just a lot of, a lot of anxiety there, a lot of sadness. And that's how I woke up this morning. So if you see a difference in me, that's what it is. And, um, you know, it's Sunday, so I can't just hide from everybody. Huh? Can't call in sick. So the only thing that I can do... And this is what I'm this is what I'm going to recommend to you. The only thing you can do is what God gives you the blessing to do. That's it. And so that's why I asked you a while ago to pray for me. And then the message I have this morning, I tried to get away from it and God just kept bringing it back to me. You know, I don't know if there's ever really a I know it's probably a bad time to preach it. I don't know when there's a good time to preach it. But it's about death. And it's something that, I don't know, I don't preach on it much. I, you know, everybody dies. But I, don't, I, I, I think we need to examine the biblical doctrine of death. Why do people die? Why do people that we care about die? Why is it we've had loved ones that have passed away from us? Why is it going to happen again? Why is it going to happen to us? Because it happens to everybody. Everybody's going to die. And I'm, I don't believe now that because I'm preaching about death, somebody's going to die this week. I don't, I don't believe that. But it just seemed like God just kept bringing this back to me, this idea of death and, and what it's really all about. And I learned this, you know, I, as like I said, I preach what I go through. And, you know, when they told us Elise had cancer, and, you know, I, we heard a little bit, of, little bit of what the doctor said about it and so on. But I did a little bit of my own study. And there's several things that doctors look for to determine whether a cell is a cancerous cell or not. And the word that you see up here, A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S, -P -P and it's pronounced apoptosis. The P is silent, the second P is silent. Like in the word banana, the P is silent. That's a joke. I didn't think it would go over too well, so anyway, but I thought I'd tell it anyway. 
But the, the second P is silent. I've listened to several people pronounce this word and it's apoptosis. Okay. And what apoptosis is, it's basically called programmed cell death. That every cell in your body, with the exception of brain cells. Brain cells are not supposed to die unless you drink them to death. Then you're killing brain cells. It's not good for you. But every cell in your body is programmed to die. Every one. You shed skin. 80% of the dust in your house is your skin. Because you're, and what you're doing is you're making more skin. The old skin dies off. New skin grows in its place. Blood cells, same thing. They're programmed to die. Tissue, organ cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets. Every, every cell in your body, with the exception of your brain, is programmed to die after it has performed what it's supposed to perform. And here's the interesting part. Some, not every cell in your body has the exact same life expectancy. Some die within four days. Some it takes several weeks. Some, some a month. And that's interesting because not everybody dies at the same age. Some die young, some die middle-aged, some die old. But everybody dies. And every cell in your body teaches you that. And so, here's why I have this up on the screen. What marks a cancer cell is the DNA has been corrupted and it destroys the programmed death that's built into that cell. So that cell now doesn't die. And I want you to think about that. That's a bad cell. And it's already eliminated in itself its own programmed death. So now that cell doesn't die. It just stays there and it occupies space and it eats up things that are good things and it keeps doing that because it doesn't die and so here we're on we're living in a world right now this came out time magazine this came out what five years ago ray kurzweil predicted that by 2045 that's the year that man becomes immortal in other words we will have figured out either by genetics or technology or a combination of both how man can cheat death and keep living and I'm telling you, man is cancer. Man is a sinful, wicked being on this earth. And men need to die. It won't be good for people who are evil to keep on living. Because they will keep on being evil. They're cancer. And they're appointed to die. And that's one of the markers of a cancerous cell is that it takes away its own programmed death. It wants to keep on living. And it is appointed unto man once to die. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. This body needs to die. Amen. I don't want it to live any longer than it has to. I don't want to go through days like what I'm going through today. I don't, I don't like them. I don't like me. I don't like days like this. I don't like the fact that I have to be the preacher today on days like this. I don't want to keep living like this. I want to go home. Old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. When you get to the point to where you're sick and tired of sinning, you'll want to die. You'll want to go and be at home in heaven. That's to those that are saved. For those that are lost, 
you should hope that you stay alive long enough for you to change your mind about Jesus. Romans 8, 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. And all of us did. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So what he said, what he said in Romans 6 is, the old man is going to be crucified, needs to be crucified, needs to be killed. But there's something better. It's like Romans 3.23. It says, for the, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And it just stops there. But when you add Romans 6.23 to that, for the wages of sin is death. Then you add, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then you understand that even though we've sinned, we still have hope that God's grace will give us everlasting life. And that's what we're seeing here. Romans 6 says the body needs to be destroyed. Romans 8 says we mortify the deeds of the body so that we can live beyond the death of this body. Amen. Colossians 3, turn there. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. If you get the 1st Thessalonians, turn back a couple pages. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So, where it says, lie not one to another. I can't lie to you and tell you everything is fine with me. I'm fine. I'm, I'm, everything's great. I can't do that. I don't want to do it. I'm not supposed to do it. And it's okay for you to come to God's house every now and then and things not be all right. Because this is the place that you need to be. Lie not one to another, seeing you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So Jesus told us that you cannot put new wine into old bottles because the old bottle will break and it'll all run out. So you put new wine in new bottles and both are preserved there is a new man inside of me that will live after the death of this old man and that's the hope that's number one the hope that we have for everybody that you and I know that has died and gone on to be with the Lord we know that they are in a better place than even we are. But then we ourselves know that one day we're going to be there with them. And some days I get a little jealous of those that have already passed on. And I say, God, why? Do I have to keep living down here? This world's bad. Our nation is so corrupt. I'll be honest with you. I'm worried about this next election. The seeds of discord have been greatly sown in our nation. Amen? And who knows what is going to happen. I'm not sure that I want to face it. But I will if God says so. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's talk about something that makes us all uncomfortable. We don't want to talk about. Let's talk about death. Heavenly Father, I ask for your help this morning both with the message and just with me. You know what's going on inside my heart. 
And I just pray, dear God, for your grace and your strength to be exhibited in my weakness. And Father, bless all of those, Lord, who today are struggling as well. Maybe things aren't as good as what they put on. And maybe they're just like me or maybe they're a little worse. Whether it's emotional or physical. And they just need strength from heaven. They need grace. And Father, your word says that the creation groans waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies, putting off this old man and being clothed upon with the righteousness of Christ and that new body. That's what we're groaning for today. And Father, I'd, I'll be honest, it would not bother me at all that we all just pack up and go be with you today forever be a good day for it but father while we're down here help us father to be about your business serving your kingdom laboring in your field helping others along who need help being a blessing to somebody that needs a blessing being a friend to somebody who could really use a friend just loving somebody that needs to be loved I pray, dear God, that you would just bless the message, help me to preach it in such a way that would honor you and edify the brethren today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Let me read this to you. The, the link there is on the bottom, but this is roughly the life of a cell. Like all living things, cells die. The number of cells that an adult male loses per minute is roughly 96 million. Every minute, 96 million of my cells die. That's a lot. That's more than I thought. I thought it was maybe a few hundred or a thousand. 96 million cells. Fortunately, in that same minute, about 96 million cells divided, replacing those that died. So... If I die, the world is not going to suffer some great loss because I've made children to replace me. More so than just Lisa and I. We, there's more than just two of us now. If we died, we've, we've replaced, we've replaced it with five. And then those have replaced it with, what are we going on? Like 12, 13, 14, 15, 14 on, with those that are on the way. So I think we've done our share. Okay, which is what, and, and that's how it happened. the population of the world is increasing, not decreasing. Because we have better medicine, we have better medical care, and the life expectancy now, you have people living in the 70s, 80s, 90 years old or better. So anyway, but 96 million cells divided, replacing those that died, just as you shed dead skin cells, dead cells from internal organs pass through and out of the body with waste products. And it's interesting that for all of us who die, we're to be planted in the ground. Well, even the cells that die off in us, they're passed out through our waste. And our waste ends up in the ground. Either way, we're all headed down to the dirt where we came from. Amen. And I just think that's interesting how that works. The length of a cell's life can vary. For example, white blood cells live for about 13 days. Cells in the top layer of your skin live about 30 days. Red blood cells live for about 120 days. And liver cells live about 18 months. Unless you drink. Which you ought not do. Because then that kills liver cells, that ki brain cells are never meant to die off once they're established. They're part of your thinking process. Your brain grows along with you and it's not supposed to die. But if you drink or you do drugs, you're killing off things in your brain that you probably need later on in life. Those that drink heavily throughout life, 
they end up suffering with it for years into their old age. So I'm just encouraging you, don't drink. Don't do drugs. That's killing you. Amen. So each one of us, like ourselves, Ecclesiastes 1, 4, one generation passeth away, but another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. And that's what happens in our bodies. Cells grow. They perform whatever function they're supposed to perform. Maybe they're heart cells or liver cells or blood cells or skin cells or whatever membranes, part of your body, bone cells, bone marrow cells. All They all serve a function. They're created from the previous cells. They perform their function for a certain period. They divide and make more cells. That's what people do. When people get to a certain age, it just seems like it's in them to want to marry and have children. And that's what happens with their children. They grow and they marry and they have children. It's just programmed into us to perpetuate. When God said, be fruitful and multiply, it was a blessing. Amen. But then, those cells, after they've lived a while and done their function... They die. And they get buried in the ground. And that's the end of it. One generation passeth away, another generation cometh. Hebrews 9.27. This is teaching us the doctrine of apoptosis. Programmed. It is written into us. Hebrews 9.27. As it is appointed unto men once to die. So it's written in the Word of God. It's written into our DNA that we're going to die. Everybody is. After this, though, the judgment. Life is not what some people say. Life is a party and then you die. And then that's it. To some people, that's what they think. They've chosen to not believe in God. They've chosen to not believe in a life after death. Or, I've been hearing, been reading a lot of things, listening to a lot of things online, hearing how some of these in the new age think. There are videos on the internet that will try to tell you that death itself is a lie. That you don't really die. You just go on and live in the cosmos for all of eternity with all of the other alien brotherhood. That's, that's a lie. But that's what people believe. There's a man by the name of Whitley Stryber. He's written, he's become famous because he writ, wrote a book about how he's been abducted by aliens. But he is a new ager to the core. And just recently, a couple years ago, his wife died in, in, a, in a speech that he gave. He said that he was able in the spirit to leave his body and travel with his wife through the cosmos to a certain place until he could go no further. And his wife said, I'll, you can catch up with me later. That's a lie. That man had devils giving him a false vision of hope in thinking that he could just live his life however he wanted to and not answer to God and that he's going to continue on and that death is a lie. I'm here to tell you it's not a lie, it's real. And after this life, there is a judgment. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. But we have the sentence of death in ourselves. A sentence is a group of words. A sentence is handed down by a judge. And that's his decision on what's going to happen because of your sins. And Paul says we have the sentence of death in ourselves. Meaning it's written into our genes. It's written in every cell in our body is going to die. And then we eventually are going to die with it. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. 2 Corinthians 4.11 For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So, you got four verses there. We need three. 
So Ecclesiastes 1, 4, Hebrews 9, 27, 2 Corinthians 1, 9, there's your three witnesses. Every body dies. There's a song, I wish I could get a copy of it. I can't find it anywhere. But Tim and Al used to play it on their radio program in the morning. It's a song recorded by Pat Boone. It's called Everybody Dies. Everybody Dies. And in that song, he says... Born once, die twice. Born twice, just die once. Everybody dies. And that's true. If you're only born once, you will die twice. You'll die in this body and you'll die. God will give you a brand new body to be put into the lake of fire and have eternal death on you. But if you're born twice, you'll die, but you'll only die once. And how we deal with death, I think, is as important as how we deal with life. We live this life understanding that when we, when we measure the span of our life, against eternity. What is that going to look like? It's going to look exactly like the Bible says it was. Our life is a vapor. Like the morning, the morning dew, the morning vapor, the morning fog. When you wake up, you see that fog, and by the time that sun rises, probably about by 9.30 in the morning, that fog is gone. And he said, that's our life. Compared, when we compare this life to everybody else's life, we think we're living a long time. When we endure hard days, it seems like the hours go by very slowly. And I'll be honest with you, there's some days that my solution to the day is just to sleep through it, to get through it. Some of you do that. I know you do. But when we compare our life to eternity, it's nothing. When we get to where some of the people that we love are already there, when we get there, that's exactly how we'll see it. But right now we don't. So we have to live it. Knowing that at some point we're going to die. Turn to Philippians. This is right before Colossians. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philippians 1.20. If I read verse 19 with it. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. That our life, as long as we live it here, is to magnify Jesus Christ. Because I, I want you to think about it. What is it from this world that once we live a certain amount of time, what is it in this world that we take with us to the next world? Not a thing. Um, who's the richest man? The guy that owns Amazon. Jeff Bezos? Richest man in the world, right? If he died today... What's he going to do with that $14 billion that he's worth? Nothing. If he's not saved, he loses not only the $14 billion and the title of being the world's richest man, but he loses his own soul. What shall it profit if man shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And Amazon.com rules the world. Along with Google and Microsoft and all them other, Apple and Samsung and all those other companies. They practically own the whole show. 
And he's gained it all. What's, what's going to happen to him? He's lost every bit of it. So when you think about that, and think about why try to attain this world's riches? Why try to attain this world's glory? Why try to attain all of this world's satisfaction? Because Solomon did, and he wrote, it was, I wasted 40 years of my life. I wasted every bit of it. It's vanity. Because when I die, I don't keep none of it. I leave this world as I came into this world with nothing. Naked as the day you were born. And then you go stand before God. Over in chapter 3, Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Let's read verse 9. Be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul said, my life, is to live, to do what God tells me to do so that my life can conform to the way Christ lived his life. How much wealth did Jesus Christ accumulate in his 33 years in this world? He didn't have nothing. He said, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests. The son of man hath not a place to lay his head. There was, he didn't own a house anywhere. He just went from one place to the next, letting God provide, letting God feed, letting God clothe him, letting God give him a place to lay his head at night. And Paul's idea was that I can be made conformable to the way Jesus lived, being conformable to his death, so that when I die, I haven't lost anything because I didn't gain anything here. I lived to live my life for God, knowing that what I was going to get after that was everything. And then that way you don't mind losing everything. There was a day in my life where I literally gave everything to God. I mean, I... I took it all out and laid it out and said, God, I give it all up. It's yours. You do whatever you want to with me. Including my own life. And in that day, God gave it back better than I ever had it before. And so this life, to me, you know, I, I enjoy... The company of my wife. I enjoy the company of my children, my family. I enjoy coming to church, be with you people. I enjoy helping people as they come our way, giving to them, even though they may not, I may not ever see them again. They may not ever come here. They may not ever give back. I enjoy that. I live for that. But also, the more that I live down here, the more sorrow that it brings me. I don't want my wife to ever get cancer again. You know, we kind of kidded around, but we were kind of halfway serious about asking God to let us die both on the same day so neither one has to suffer one another's loss. Because I don't want that. She don't want it either. Some of you that have already lost people, my heart goes out to you. Because it's hard. But one of these days, turn to John 12.
And I'm going to move through some of this and get to the end of it. John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Think about that. One grain of wheat falling into the ground produces how much? How many other grains of wheat on one stalk? Hundreds. Hundreds. So he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And I'm here to tell you, I hate this life. I love the people in it. I love the Lord that I serve. I love the word that I read. But I hate this life. And if you were to ask me, you know, Mike, we've got a cure for all your diseases. We can extend your life. You can live four or five hundred more years. No. I don't want that. I don't want that. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 6. I'm going to close with that. Romans chapter 6. While you turn to Romans 6. I'm going to read Hebrews. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Hebrews 9, 15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And all of everything that God has in store for us, it must be attained only by death. Only by death. Romans 6. This is the chapter. If somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, I want to be baptized, never been baptized before, or I was sprinkled when I was a child, and that, to me, that don't cut it. I want to be baptized. I go to Romans 6. Romans 6 then explains what baptism is all about, why we do it the way we do it, why we don't splash water on somebody's head. That, to me, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Death is not just getting knocked in the head. It's getting buried. But it's not burying. Planting. Planting the seed. Romans 6, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When you were baptized, you established your belief that one of these days you're going to die. But, let's see, when I baptized Matthew, he was just a little boy. I didn't hold him there under the water. I wanted to, but I didn't. I raised him back up. Because I wanted my son to believe. That if he sees his mom and dad die. We're not dead anymore. We're already. And I wanted him to understand that when he faces death, he won't stay dead. That's going to be like because I haven't done it yet. We don't have people coming back from the dead. Like, do we? And the people who say they've done that, I don't believe them. This is what this book says. So I can't tell you what. Just know that when I draw through disease, old age, thing happening. Alive with Jesus. 
from the body is to be and it's instant so verse 4 baptism into death as Christ was by the glory of the Father so should walk in newness on the cross remember me when you come into your what did Jesus say is that what he said that's not what he said he's this day paradise Verse 5. Not buried. Is the seed. Resurrection. The new. For if we've been. Of his death. In the likeness. Knowing. Man is that the body that he serves sin that in this is again ever for he. Head with we shall it's ready Death conquers death. Christ's death conquers our death. Verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Already have it in your mind, people. So let me ask you a question. Do you really, do you right now, at this moment, do you believe your name is written down in God's book of life? You've already attained it. You've already attained it. If you bought a Powerball ticket, $585 million ticket, and you watch the news one night, Gary, and you found out that your ticket matches all the numbers and nobody else won. What would you do? <laughs> right? Would you dance? Would you shout? Would you get happy? Yes! Now, you don't have the money yet. But I got the ticket. And you're just going, I hope nothing happens between now and wherever I got to turn this ticket into. 
but you've already won it. If your name is already written, you've already won it. It's already there. You're already dead to sin. The only thing that's got to take place is you have to stop breathing. And then you get it. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed in the sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I'm hoping that nobody we know dies this week. Because I don't want you to say, Brother Mike preached that and lo and behold somebody died. I don't, I don't want that on my conscience. I don't know why God wanted me to preach this. It's something that we don't like talking about. We don't like saying, okay, now when I die, you know, this, I want this to happen. Don't, don't talk that way. You're, I don't want, you're not going to die. Just forget about that. And we, because we don't want anybody that we love to die, but we have to talk about it. We have to face it. We all have to deal with it, Gary. Because people that we know have already died. Some of the people that we know that died went to heaven. And some of the people that we know that died, we know they didn't go. So what that means then is, all the rest of the people that we know, who we know are not going to heaven, don't you think they need to know? They need to know. Because if they don't, you should hope that they live another three or four hundred years to figure it out. And that God will have mercy on them. Because they're going to die and go to hell. But to those who you do know that know they're going like if you came up and said brother Mike what do you think is going to happen when you die I'm going to say I'm going to live forever with Jesus in heaven and there's no doubt in my mind about it so if I die I die but I'm going to live forever and right now I'm not afraid of that you know I've said this before and I'll say it again I'm going to close that day I was electrocuted I had it in my mind that I was going to die underneath my house that day alone and I had already surrendered to death I did I said Mike this is it this is how you go this is it you're fixing to stand before God and I want to tell you I said, God, please have mercy on me, a sinner. So, I've asked God, God, if you do this for real the next time, number one, not electrocution. Something easier. And number two, I don't want to be afraid. And I think I'm going to be like, like Lee Walsh was when he died. Dan Rao. Brother Keith. David Toomey. Those guys, I remember talking to David. I got alone with him. Everybody left and I sat down with him and David looked at me and he said, I know I'm going to die. He said, I know I'm going to die. David, are you ready? He said, I'm ready. And I made a promise to him we'd take care of Linda. I want the peace in my heart. 
the knowing. And I don't want to be afraid. And the faith that I have, I believe that I won't be. I may be now, but I won't be then. I don't think God will let us be afraid on that day. Okay? I've seen it too many times. Too many people with so much peace in their heart, you could see it in their face. And they knew. Let's bow our heads.